going to introduce the speakers that we have um, and the motion. So the exact motion is this house, as a parent with a financial means to do so, not just anyone, um, would choose not to send their children to private school. And on proposition, we've got George Clay. George is an accomplished um, schools and university level debater. He was ranked top at the European Championships this summer. He was ranked in one of the top five teams in the World Championships just a few weeks ago. Um, he is very good at debating, as is everyone else. He went to Eton, which you might find interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Yet he's on proposition. Um, was I not supposed to say that? <laughs> just, just read the things. I was told not to read those things. I blamed them. Just read those things. Read them. Uh, yeah. Our second speaker on proposition is Karis Bradley. Karis is also highly accomplished. Wait, we can clap. Yeah. Or you can clap for George now. Um, and I can introduce each speaker as their turn starts. So we can now welcome George and we can welcome everyone else. Um, so big hand of applause for George. somehow were not as good as you and didn't do enough to earn that right to be think about. And we also think that in many cases that there will be desire. <coughs> there will be things which deliberately the school does to set you apart. Maybe you'll be forced to wear a silly hat as I was for the of years of my life. Maybe you'll be put through cute little rituals, tied up naked in a chair and left in the bathroom all night. I mean it's funny until you realise people are dying. 
there may be other things as well. Every single private school has an incentive to sell itself as the best possible. Every single private school has an incentive to say that we uniquely can give your child the opportunity to lead in a cutthroat competitive world, whatever the catchphrase is these days. They have an incentive to say, we are excellent in all things. Look at our exam results. Look at the ways in which we set ourselves apart from other schools. Your whole culture of your school is sold as a product to savvy consumers, and it has that incentive to market itself as somehow unique and somehow special, and it tells you by extension that you yourself are special. And maybe you read about yourself in the papers as well. Maybe you read about your school in the papers. The papers which say that your <coughs> school is unusual, that your school is not like other people's. And it says that because of that, you're set apart. Note, by the way, that criticism of these structures only tends to strengthen you for the simple reason that if you read something which says private schools are oppressive, private schools are homophobic, private schools are sexist, your reaction isn't to say, oh, Maybe it is the case that my school is problematic. Maybe it is a problem that two of my best friends didn't feel able to come out to me until long after we left. Maybe it is a problem that everyone I've ever met and all of my friends think of women as less than men by some bizarre extension of themselves. You don't think those thoughts explicitly because you don't think it can be you. You don't think you're the problem. You never do. Human beings have a remarkable tendency to self congratulate And because of that, we simply don't think you're capable of criticizing that structure. We simply think you buy into it even more. What exactly are the consequences of that? What are you as a person? What do you feel like when you come out of that kind of structure? What exactly is it that you've been through? We think, firstly, you've been through pressure. It is true that private schools confer some advantages. It is more true that those advantages are often not worth it. Because you are told when you go into one of these schools that you need to perform for all the reasons I've already outlined. That's a need to perform which stays with you <coughs> forever. It is not a coincidence that the most successful girls' private school in the country also has the highest rates of anorexia. It is not a coincidence that Oxbridge, that finishing school of private schools, produces by far the highest rate of depression and self-harm of anywhere in the UK, probably anywhere in Western Europe. You're unable to ask for help at the same time because you're being told every single moment that this, you're meant to be having the time of your life. You're being told every moment that you've had an opportunity that no one else has. And your ability to say, I am miserable, I am not enjoying this, is crippled because of that. And equally, the fact that someone has sacrificed so much to put you there. Again, anything you say against it seems like ingratitude. And you can't speak out because of that and you suffer in silence because of that. But what's almost more alarming is that if you come out of that okay, if you come out of that ready to take on the world, and ready to walk up to 10 Downing Street, or whatever the, wherever the Conservative Party is going to send you next, then you're not the kind of person who's going to thrive in those roles. Well, you are going to thrive, but not in the ways which make people happy. You're not going to be someone with compassion. You're not going to be someone who respects the right of others to have the same opportunity as you. You're still going to have that sense of perspective. And I don't think you're going to make the world a better place because of this. On this side of the house, we want what's best for our fictional kids. But when they come home when they're 18, I don't want my kids to be strangers. I don't want to fuck them up. I don't want to make them bad people. But most of all, I don't want to change them. And that's why I'm closing this mic. I'd like to thank George very much for that fine speech. The first speaker for the opposition is Ed Mansi. Ed is a mathematics student at Warwick and uses debating to forget this fact. As a speaker, he has won multiple national competitions and holds the record for Warwick internal victories. He was educated at a traditional northern grammar school. Please welcome Ed. I'm a bit confused, really, because I expected a very different line from the government. I expected him to talk about, like, uh, how private education hurts state education to the art. So my speech, in many ways, is very unprepared 
And I didn't want to make any kind of personal tech tool, but I just want to note that George's experience of private school and what he thinks comparative seems to be really is very Eton centric. I went to a private school that didn't share any of the stuff he talked about. We didn't wear fancy hats or anything. People weren't tortured in bathrooms. We weren't made to feel like we were special, better than everyone else. And furthermore, the comparative is, right, and they don't acknowledge this in this side, just how, to what extent the state lets down people who don't attend private school or work the country, right? Um, outside of London, the average state school has under 20% of its students getting English baccalaureate. So that means under 20% of students get a GCSE, an A star to C, and an English, two sciences, maths, and a language. That's what you need at GCSE to attend a local group university. So if you're sending your child to a school, then you have to accept there's a high likelihood, right, that they're not going to get to go to a local group university, and that's going to massively affect their life. And we like to think, because everyone in this room, almost definitely, either went to uh, some form of private school or one of the best per, like, uh, state schools in the country, right? And it was very nice for us to pretend that like, the state system is like the, the nice state school we went to in Richmond or whatever. But that's not true, right? It's not true in Bradford, where I'm from, right? It's not true all over the country, right? Day in, day in, day, in, day out, the vast majority of children are let down by the state se se sector. And for huge parts of the country, your only way out from the systemic failure of the state in education is private school. And the choice isn't like being like a conservative minister in like Downing Street or like being a lawyer or whatever George thinks the alternative is, right? The choice is that thing or like no career at all. So three points in particular to George. And so he says private schools set you apart and make you feel special. But that all children at a young age, due to human psychology, do feel special and that's what the centre of the world is. And education and the way in which you get civic education, whatever, to where teach now if you, that can be better at private school. But secondly, in this motion, we are the parents. We're not going to tell our kids that, like, here's the other thing in the world better than Melton special, right? We're probably on our side of the house not going to send them to a boarding school, and we're going to have a large role in their education upbringing, and we're going to be able to tell them this kind of stuff, tell them that they're privileged, tell them that, like, they aren't better than other people or whatever. So all of this can, like, account for when you're not sending your kids to Eton, so you probably won't do some of the problems they point out. And secondly, it says that price wars to be sold as excellent um, so like an everything, but that's not true. Mine wasn't, right? The other schools nearly weren't. It was sort of particularly good for welfare or particularly good for sports or whatever it is, right? It doesn't necessarily actually have to be sold as great for everything all the time. It doesn't have to have this intense pressure. He's talking about elite private schools. He's talking about sending your like, kids to Westminster or St Paul's or Harrow or Eton. But that is not what most private schools up and down the country are like, right? Most private schools up and down the country have fees of about 10 grand a year, right? That's barely, that's like just so incomparable to the amount charged by those other places. And thirdly, it talks about homophobia and sexism, right? But there's no comparative, and we're not told whether this is better or worse than the rest of society, which we see around us as being an incredibly homophobic and sexist world. And we think the better civic education you pay for in a private school, the fact that I learned about second and third grade feminism at school, it's going to have a bigger impact in changing those beliefs in young people than the poor civic education you get in most schools up and down the country. So what do we stand for on our side of the house? Obviously, we would not send our, ch our child to all schools all of the time. That's not possible. And we think that probably we can't afford elite schools like Eton or Harrow or whatever else that really compete to be the very best or the very best. And we'd also say that if the state schools in our area are on a par with what the private school system is in our area, we probably will save the money. But in towns and cities up and down the country, there's a failure of state education in this case, we'll send to private school. I had some stuff about why we have special duties to our children. They seem to concede that, so I'm going to continue. What I am going to say is we do a duty to provide for our child's welfare, right? So we have a primary ability to do so, and we also want to because we love our children. In the private school, this is a sensible choice because we don't know if our child's going to um, either have like a mental illness or learning disability or physical disability at some point in the future. We don't know if our child's going to suffer from bullying or, or, or other issues potentially due to their identity in the future. We don't know if we're going to fall in with the wrong group and suffer from drugs or alcohol problems in the future. But, or even, we don't know if there's going to be... But what we say for all those issues, right, is that private schools, which they have more resource developed to it and, and do it more, have a much greater ability to deal with these welfare issues, right? So if someone in my school 
well, um, chain down many of these things, they'll be immediately diagnosed and have like, a better treatment, right? The real reason why like, Oxford is a high point for mental illness is because mental illness, and the vast majority of people who have the United Kingdom, it goes undiagnosed, so it doesn't turn up in the statistics, right? If you go to Oxford that's diagnosed, you can get help with it, right? If you go to private school, you get the actual help you need for these things. We think it's actually dangerous to ignore that, so you have the ability to provide that service, right? Have that facility to provide that better welfare. And again, even if it's something as simple as my kid, what would really make them happy, what would be their version of a good life is to play the trumpet or something, um, and I can provide that for them, if I neglect to do it, right? they, they don't have that same sense of purpose in that life, an activity which they gain well-being from. Not choosing, not choosing to not send them to private school, it's to choose to sacrifice their welfare in a great way. But furthermore, going forward, when we're talking about education, as I said in my sort of introduction, it's a distressing fact about the world that the vast majority of state schools, the ones which we would probably have to send our kids to otherwise, the one that I would have had to have gone to work by certainly, for most of the children who go there, do not provide an education which will get them to a rough school university. And we think it's incredibly naive and idealistic to assume that our child would be in that 20% who got to get a good education, right? Why? I mean, that's not statistically likely, and it's just, you know, us thinking a lot about ourselves and not much more. I mean, it has a huge ability in their future life, whether or not they get that five A's to C's in English, maths, two sciences and language, right? It radically changes their life. Changes their <coughs> having money gives you the freedom to, have, to realistically be able to make choices with what you do with your life, uh, make like, people with money are, have much better physical and mental health and are just much happier, right? And when we choose to ignore that in the way Georgia does, then they'll just be fine in the state system when we don't know, right? We are taking a massive risk for the future welfare of our children. It is depressing that we live in the United Kingdom where the state sector systematically fails the vast majority of its students. But with that being the case, because we do have the ability to opt out, we ought to. I urge you to oppose. I'd like to thank Ed very much for that fine speech. Our following speaker is Keres Keres Bradley. Keres is a European University's Debating Championship <laughs> semi-finalist and a graduate of King's College London. She has yet to decide whether she cares more about her debating achievements or her mathematics degree. She was educated at an old girls' grammar school, which she hated, but at least her parents didn't have to pay for, for her traumatic experience. Please welcome Karis. So, the comparison in this debate is not between the worst comprehensive school that has ever existed and one of the best private schools that have ever existed, because we think there are good examples of private schools and bad examples of private schools as there are good examples of comprehensive schools and bad examples of comprehensive schools. There do exist comprehensive schools where you can take your GCSE and also learn to play the trumpet. Um, so we think that the mischaracterization that we get from side opposition is an unfair one um, and, and one that we reject. Right? We think the main difference in terms of the schools that we are talking about here is whether or not we pay for them. Because if we have the money to afford to send our children to a private school, we think we can probably like, live in a good area where there are like high quality comprehensive schools and the child will get a comparable level of education. So that's the comparison that we're actually talking about. Two arguments. First of all, the money makes the bad things worse. You're always taking a risk wherever you put your child, there's a chance it's going to go wrong. If you pay for that experience, then there are going to be more problems than if you haven't. And second of all, privately educated children are less likely to feel their privilege, given the fact that they are privileged, we need them to do that so they do not perpetuate the system of privilege, which we'll talk about slightly later. <coughs> And they, they, if your child is aware of the fact that you are forking out a considerable amount of money for the education um, that they, that, that, that they are, are experiencing, um, and as George explains to you, they place high pressure on those children in order to do well, they tell them they are special, they should be succeeding, they're going to go on and do great things, but they also know that you're making a great sacrifice for them, they are less likely to admit when they are not doing so well, when they are not enjoying their education, when they are being bullied, when they're struggling with their studies, um, when they are suffering from things like, like mental illness, 
regardless of whether they are diagnosed or not. But this is hugely problematic because if you don't talk about your problems, you cannot get help for them. If you do not talk to your parents about the problem because you think, uh, or you feel ashamed of the fact that you are wasting that amount of money on their education, you are not doing very well, we this creates a huge problem, it creates resentment between um, yourself and your child. We think we would prefer our, our child not to learn to play the trumpet, but actually have a good relationship with us, no thank you, as opposed to the latter. We think that when people are suffer in silence, this makes the problems work, problems work. The only distinction that we are talking about in this debate is whether or not you are paying, uh, paying for the education. And that in and of itself can, um, can, can exacerbate the problem. We think that your child might be bullied in the real world, but they're not also paying, or you're not paying for the privilege of them to be bullied. We don't understand why you should have to pay that, uh, that amount of money for the bad experience. We're told by Ed that private schools do a much better job of dealing with problems. We think this to be intuitively false. If you run your school as a business, you have to encourage people to come there so that you can stay open. You do not talk about problems that exist. You do not talk about the high levels of mental, uh, mental health. You publish articles about how everyone in Eton came out and it was fine, when the actual reality is that a lot of people remain positive. We think this is hugely problematic. We think that state and um, state schools are more accountable to these problems and therefore um, are less likely, if they have the resources, which many of them do, to deal with those problems, to actually deal with them. Second argument, moral argument, about privately educated children and why they don't feel um, their privilege and why that's bad. If you went to a private school, you are more likely to go to university. If you go to, or to a Russell Group University, if you go to a Russell Group University, you're more likely to get a graduate job. If you get a graduate job, you're more likely to end up in a highly paid position. If you end up in a highly paid position, you're more likely to be able to afford to, set, to send your children to private school. We think this is a harmful cycle which perpetuates privilege and keeps it centered um, in a select group of people. And um, we think particularly because the education itself is comparable, and the main difference is whether or not you pay for it and, and the actual privilege that you are buying simply by having the label of going to a private school. Um, we think that it is wrong to participate in the system, um, uh, and we, we, we do not think that opposition can prove that you actually gain a sufficient amount um, in, in life quality difference, no thank you, for their children um, in order to, to actually be complicit in this perpetuation of privilege and in, within this harmful system. We want them to prove that like every person has to go to, to Oxbridge in order to have a good university experience. We want them to prove that every person has to become CEO of their company in order to feel as if they've actually achieved something in life. We think that you can actually have a reasonably good like middle of the road job, where you can have an actually reasonably good uh, amount of money, but not be able to pay uh, for, and have succeeded in life and, and live comfortably without being able to pay for your children um, to go to private school. We don't think that you have to be that wealthy in order for you to have succeeded. We think the gains are minimal, um, and that the situation of uh, the, the privilege perpetuation um, that is created is harmful. Why is that? The things, no thank you, that George, you didn't take me away from us, so you can say so the things that George told you about the kind of atmosphere that is created in which people who go into these private schools and are told that they are special, that they are born to succeed, they are a selected privilege, makes them either, like if they have a good experience, believe that and believe that they are deserving, therefore people who did not get to the same position as them are not deserving, or if they did not have a good experience, they are unable to see the privilege um, that, that has allowed them to get to the position where they are, they think they actually had an incredibly difficult time of it, you know, they worked extremely hard, they didn't see that they had it significantly easier because they came with a, with a, with a good name attached um, on their, their UCAS statement which made it significantly easier for them to get an interview at university, they had interview practice at their school which meant that they were much, easier, but much more comfortable in that sort of scenario and got into university um, at, 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 lower, at lower effort than, than people who come from different backgrounds. We think either um, they do not perceive themselves to be privileged because they had a bad time or they cannot see that privilege because they've always been told that they are deserving and that others aren't. What this means is when they do get into positions of power, when they do make it um, into their Oxbridge elite or, or Russell Group University, when they do go on to run their company um, or, or make it um, into government or, or how else they are, or, or another position of power, we think that they are less likely to see the system as anything other than a meritocracy. When people grow up with this perspective and are unable to see the privilege which has got to the position that they are, they are less likely to attempt to deviate from the system, to try and change it, to enable other people um, to, to, to get to that position as well. We think that this is incredibly problematic. By sending your child to private school, you, are, you can either actually actively contribute to their suffering um, uh, in, in the way that I took this from my first argument, but you also fund um, an unfair system that strengthens economic divides and then awards power and privilege to a select few, um, making these attributes hereditary when they never ever should be. 
Um, and we think that further you perpetuate the part of the system that stops those people from being able to see the system itself, which means that the people who do end up in power are less likely to enact that power and to change the system. We think that there is so many things wrong with primary schools, from the fact that they can screw up your children, um, to the fact that, that, that they create the idea that state schools are not good enough, um, but also because they perpetuate the system, I realise I've said that word a lot, but I didn't bring my ears towards me. Um, they perpetuate the system of privilege that makes it harder for other people to succeed. We do not want to be complicit in that. We don't think maybe that our children get a sufficiently good enough education in comparison to the average state school in order to justify um, us being complicit in that system. We beg you to vote. Raised by wolves in the wilds of West Wales, Tito has an unnerving predilection for bow ties and musical theatre. He is a world's quarter finalist, 20th best speaker in the world, and has won multiple intervarsity competitions. He is also a teach first teacher in a state school in Birmingham. Please welcome Tito. <laughs> Than private schools. 
um, there's far fewer out LGBT people. So I've, I've been to two schools actually, I've been told that there are no gay students in this school, uh, both state schools, I don't believe them. And also, it's hard to become well-rounded when you're stuck in the debt trap, which by the way, about half of our recent graduates from state schools find themselves within two years of leaving that school. And the real question is, how do you improve the standards in state schools, right? Because it's not the case that the, the problem is that we tell kids in private schools they're special. The problem is that we don't tell kids in the state schools that they're special often enough. You know, they deserve it because they're human beings. Um, I'm going to come on to now, how, how do we actually, how do we raise the standards in those state schools? Because I think that the contra charisma speech, which talks about um, hoarding privilege and, um, and, and passing on, passing on that privilege to the next generation, um, I think there are, there are far more meaningful, both, the, both symbolically and practically, things you can do in order to raise those standards in the state sector. If that's really what you care about, right? Other than this one. I mean, if you start from the assumption that you've got some moral duty to improve state schools, right, or to improve the outcome of people less, less, off, less, less well off than you are, which presumably they do when you're talking about hoarding privilege, um, I mean, we'd agree. I think that educational disadvantage is maybe one of the single biggest issues facing us at the moment. That's why I joined Teach First. But the problem is if you're concerned about it, there are much better things you can do, right? Why don't we just go and campaign on behalf of a local school? Why don't you join or donate to a national campaign like Teach First, which has a, a 20 year action plan, which we hope will work, to, to, to end educational inequality? Um, you can volunteer, right? So there's, there's an enormous shortage of school governors right now. That means that there are lots of state schools that aren't having sensible decisions made. I mean, there are basically no competent school governors right now. Um, presumably, if you're, you know, you've done well in your career, you can. Uh, to, to make the money to send to private school, presumably you're a fairly good decision maker. Presumably you can go and help that school by volunteering as a governor. Um, I think it'd be wise though. Oh, yeah. So, why does someone have to go to a Russell Group University in order to have a high quality of life? Well, they don't necessarily. I mean, I, I didn't. Um, but, I mean, if you. What we're looking at though is that if you. Like, so, because you like. <laughs> in terms of just like comparative advantage, if you go to Russell Group University, you're likely to get into a first, right? If you don't go to Russell University, you're far less likely to get into something like Teach First. Um, you're more much more likely to be unemployed if you go to, I mean, my university, Aberystwyth, about half the people that go there actually don't get graduate jobs after they leave that university. It's not clear that all universities are a good prospect for everybody. <coughs> but also, lots of them don't fit into university whatsoever. And if we compare, say, who was on preschool meals to attend state schools, where about, you know, um, where 20% of them actually end up getting to university at all, 80% don't. And we compare that to students, say, on a scholarship at a private school, then those students are actually doing much better off despite them having you know, the same start. So this, the, the comparison here is more dramatic than these guys would have you believe. Um, and, and the way that we solve that, if we have that kind of compassion, is by doing meaningful things for the state sector, by going in there and volunteering, by attempting to change the political discourse around education, um, but by engaging in politics, and all of that sort of thing. And it's not by making um, a kind of strange, self-sacrificial statement to the world, which involves risking the welfare and the future of your child. When your child's successful, by the way, under your influence, and that, you, know, you would influence them to become somebody who cares about, uh, about education and equality and all those things that we care about. I think it's more likely that they themselves would go on and become an advocate for those kind of things too. And so, Again, it's just not clear that the utility of improving that sector lies with these guys. And also, we just doubt the comparison that they try to give us. So for those reasons, we're happy to do that. I'd like to thank Tina very much for that fine speech. Uh, for the next 15 to 20 minutes, the floor is open to you guys. If you want to make if you want to ask a question that the summary speakers can then deal with when their turn comes, if you want to make a point either in defense of the motion, in opposition of the motion, um, if for some reason you want to abstain from the motion, um, now now's the time for you to do that. Um, does anybody have a point to begin with? Who wants to go first? Yeah. Um, I think it's a character that um, they pretend that states aren't good enough. Uh, I'm someone who's, my parents actually offered me the choice when I was 12. They said, do you want to go to private school, stay in state school? 
um, I chose to stay to school, but I'm wondering like what they feel um, proposition about sort of parents giving the children the choice to give to. Does anybody else have anything? Be here, you must have views on this. Yeah. Okay, so if 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 the people who go to a private school, um, in like must like come out with this system of either they um like like fit like because if they if they become successful, they just inherently can't be like aware of their privilege. Or if they if they don't become successful, then like they can't talk about their problems because of uh, like because of the money spent on it. Surely, 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 like for the majority of children who go to private sector, the fact that their parents spend a huge amount of money on them, they're not like cogently hugely aware of like how big of a deal it is that their parents spend that spend that spend that amount of money on them. Like it's been in the, like short period in that, in that, that, that originally at first, right? But then, as as the, as they grow older, they they tend to be, they tend to become more aware of those things, so, and they and they and so I, I don't see why a child in a private school is going to be like, especially when they're quite young, is going to be so aware of their situation. They're going to realise that um, like that you know like the parents have given them so much money. Like children, they're normally quite selfish. So I don't I don't I don't, I don't see why they might they're any more likely to want to like um, hide their problems because of that. But also. What, why they why they're less likely to realise the situation they're in as they grow older, like any other like adult. I don't. I don't see why that's true. Does anybody else have something to say? Yeah. Um, I think there's a
would normally have a percent. But however, if I am from an educated background, if I have sufficient money at my disposal, then I will usually be able to even at the state school to provide this environment for my child, for example, by buying private tutoring or buying trumpet lessons. Additionally, I will be able to inspire my child myself, go to museums with help with the marks. So a private school makes only sense if I myself am not able to do that because, for example, I have a very low education. However, if that is the case, I certainly won't have the money to send my child to a private school. So if I am in a position to send it, then it's not necessary. If I'm not, then it's not possible. The first two things that you think um, that the only way you can use the so called privilege tool uh, is if you go to a private school. But um, if you go to a state school, it doesn't really matter if you go to a state school or private school if you come from a background uh, or you have money or privilege background, if you will be both automatically given that you know, all these values and norms
if you come home from school and then have a tutor. You just don't have any, right? So let's talk about duty to your child. So no child, George is right, no child would be the same would say gone through school, right? And that just, and if they've gone to private school or if they've gone to a state school, they're not going to be the same child afterwards. But crucially, we don't know what they're going to be like afterwards. And we don't know what their needs are going to be if they're going to have you know, certain disabilities, mental health problems, if they're going to face discrimination based on their identities uh, in a bit. Um, we don't know about that sort of thing, right? So we think that what we do have to do is to make sure that the kids are okay, right? So in, put yourself in that position, right? There is a, somebody that you are so closely bound to that you are probably willing to die for. We do not think that you should sacrifice that person's well-being in order to like fulfill some liberal sense of guilt that you might have, which we think is ultimately misplaced, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you please explain to me how I have a first class degree in mathematics, given the fact that I went to a state school? Yes, because some people are exceptional. I'm happy to say, <laughs> um, you know, some of like some people who go to like state schools will get through and will do well. Right? I hope that I will become one of the people that has a first class degree quite soon. Right? But overall, right, I went to some of the best state schools in West Yorkshire. Right? The one of them was a technicality away from going into special measures. Some, somebody got thrown through a window. And clever kids, crucially, are routinely bullied at these schools. I know that. Sean knows that. Every, like, I'm sure loads of you guys know that. Clever kids are routinely bullied at state schools in a horrible, horrible way, right? We think that we should take our, our, our kids out of that environment if we have the opportunity to, because it's an incredibly traumatic experience, right? These guys have missed just how bad state schools are, right? Even the best ones are create horrible experiences for your, for your children, which means that they are not going to be happy in the long term. We don't think that's something that we are, that we are happy to accept. No, no. So Kerry says that we have a duty to society to make them socially conscious if it, uh, and, and that sort of thing if the, if the education sets forth is on average all right. So note that it just isn't all right, right? Because the majority of schools do not give your child the option to do what they want to do with your life, right? But even if, and it's not the point that, you know, they go to a Russell Group University, right? That's where, the, that's where they miss the point. The point is that they have the option to do what they want to do with their life. They can't do things like, you know, Meet David Hockney, right? So Bradford Grammar like takes art students to like meet David Hockney. They they can't do that sort of thing, right? If they go to states, well maybe you know they're not going to be happy unless they can pursue their passion for art, things like that. But because we don't know that, we think we have to try and give our child the option. We think that is very important. The state schools on average take away those options from our children. We think that just isn't good enough. We think that we care about these people so much because they're so intricately bound up with our own sense of self and our own sense of ha happiness, that we want them to be happy and we want them to, to give the best opportunities that we can. So let's talk briefly towards the end about the duties of the wider education system. And so Kerry says that you shouldn't prop up an unfair system and perpetuate that privilege. So we point out firstly that state schools just aren't good enough to give you the ability to make that choice. I know because I went to one and it was horrible. We point out that firstly state that, that if Improving the wider education system is something that you care about. We've given you plenty of examples, right? So Tito says, governors, right? We think that is important, right? That those people have an ability to you know, make a massive difference to a school, right? And that sort of thing. You donate to Teach First. Or like, so lots and lots of schools are desperate for reading mentors because the failure of the state school system means that lots of kids go to secondary school not being able to read. Right? So me, Ed and Maxine did, did a, a debating program with kids in inner city commentary, right? The kids in Ed's class couldn't read, right? And these are 10 year old kids that are going to, to, like, uh, to uh, secondary school, right? They turn up not being able to read. You think one, a private, if the parent had the option to the send them to private schools, they'd be able to like, deal with that more effectively. But also, given that the, like, the school has, has failed so completely, we don't think we would send our kids to the, 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 the corresponding uh, senior school. But finally, if you do care so much about that sort of thing, right, then, then send your kid to the good school and make other kids' lives better by doing other things in your spare time. But state schools are not good enough to be an option for our kids if we have, an option, if we have the option to take them out.
incredibly proud to stand on this other hand. I'd like to thank George very much for that fine speech. Our final speaker for the debate today is Sean Bedford. Sean grew up in a village on the outskirts of Stoke-on-Trent and was educated at her local state school. She had literally no idea what debating was until her freshman year at Warwick, where she followed her housemate and ended up in a debating session. Years later, she will soon hold the record for a number of Warwick debating committees, one person owns. And she has mixed feelings about it. Please welcome Sean.
That's not the same as saying you send your child to this school and there's a 50% chance whether they're going to get those grades, right? That's completely different. What's far more important in a child's life is parent influence, right? Their views on university, whether you've been told since you were little, or if you want to go to university, you can't. No sense to you, right? Whether you're told, whether your parents sit down and ask you about your homework, whether they care about your relationship with your teacher, whether they care about sending you to extracurricular activities. That is presumably going to happen on either side of the debate, right? Privately schooled, common is, right? On private school signs, you're surrounded by people who are also in that position, who also have bedtime stories read to them, who also go to museums at the weekends, who also do extracurriculars. What we bring you from the state school is how to deal with people who don't have that, who don't come from that background. And we think that's good because it prepares you for actual society and actual life. So when you go into the world and you job, you're not. But so the problem with like, let's talk a little bit now about the benefits and harms of sending your children to the private school to the child, right? So more than moving wire private school back, right? Private schools actually have like an incentive to say they are best and special, right? Because they're so competitive, it's a competitive market, right? And to be the best private school in the area, you want to say that because then you get the best kids in the area, or what they call the best kids, right? So it's even more important for the lower tiers than it is for Eton, because Eton has a name. Eton can get anybody it really wants, right? It's not the case um, for the local ones, right? They want to be the best in the area. They say to the child, I'm special, I'm superior, right? But this is a lot of pressure on kids, especially if you pay for it. As Karis brings you, right? You're paying through child education. The child sees that as a sacrifice. Your child sees that as something that parents are doing to them. So that's also a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure to be like constantly being told by the school that you're, you're the best, you're one of the best, and you're superior. And you feel like you can't tempt anybody uh, if you let them down. Because you let them down not only your school, but you let them down your parents, you let them down yourself. You feel like you're failing. Or you have a good experience and then you thrive, right? So the problem with that is pain makes it work, right? Because it perpetuates the old boys' club. If you've got an ego shit, you thrive in that environment. The idea that it's not who you are, it's who you are, right? They have, but those people, those people in, in cabinet and stuff, they're making decisions that affect the real world without having experienced the real world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a gamble which child, where you send your child, right? You can't look into the crystal ball and know where to send it. The case is your child will have a much better, much rounded education if you send them to the local state school. I'd like to thank Sean very much for that fine speech. Can we have one final round of applause for us? <laughs> a couple things before we wrap up. Um, firstly, it's not just the speakers today that we want to thank. It's also Teach First. Teach First, like, from this debate and from other experiences you may have had, um, like, it is clear that Teach First do critical work by providing teachers and schools that need them perhaps the most. Um, and, and Oli from Teach First is going to talk a bit more about that so coming up to the um, But also Teach First sponsor us, they sponsored this event, they've allowed us to be able to pay for, for travels with George and Karis, uh, for, to pay for travels of other speakers and other public debates we host, and the debate society as whole, allowing us to just create more and more discussions about education and quality on campus. Um, and we're very grateful to, to them, and I'd like one final round of applause. Yeah, don't worry, I'm not going to make a speech now. I'm certainly not going to wade into this debate. I think if I did, I'd need a hard hat because uh, that was uh, pretty, uh, pretty heated and um, really, really interesting to see. So um, thank you very much uh, for speaking. I found it really, really uh, very exciting and really interesting. As I say, I'm not going to and I've weighed into this at all. I know you guys have got your thoughts on this, and I really hope you're going to continue to discuss this um, once this is finished um, formally. Um, one thing that I kind of reflected on as I was listening to different points of view is that everyone really does have um, very strong opinions when it comes to this topic in particular. Um, and one thing that we all share in common um, is that we all had an education, and we've all come from very different backgrounds. Um, some of us have gone to private schools, 
Some of us have come from very normal state comprehensive schools, and others have gone uh, to very, very different schools across the spectrum. Um, and I think what is interesting is that kind of diversity of experience that we have in this room, and obviously the diversity of experience that we have on the panel. Um, one thing I did want to kind of reflect is that regardless of where you kind of sit on this debate, like whether you sit on the, the side that are proposing or on the other side, and um, I think most people, I hope most people in this room will agree that actually inequality in education is a really, really pervasive issue and it's something that isn't fair. Um, and unfortunately, as it's been highlighted by both sides, um, there are a huge number of kids in the UK um, who are um, not reaching up in potential for a variety of reasons. Um, but the majority and the children who are on preschool don't necessarily get the grades that they need to go on uh, to study A levels, go to university, or just have the, the best chance in life. And we feel really passionately about this. I know many of you will know Teach First and know what we do. And, and, it's, and it's really and very articulately say we, we try and find great teachers to go into schools and to make an impact in schools in low income communities. This room is obviously full of people who are really interested in this issue. And if you are keen to talk to myself, my colleague Catherine, who's at the back of the room, and who works as a graduate recruitment officer for Warwick, she's amazing, and we would love to speak to you. Um, because it's clear, as I say, you have views on this. We want to hear what you've got to say, um, and if it's something that you are keen to potentially pursue and actually make a difference in a, in a community um, and really become an outstanding teacher, um, then we may be um, a, a fantastic way for you to do that. So we'd love to talk to you. Uh, but thank you again for having us here this evening, um, and I hope you all have a Thank you very much, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, if you're interested in more events, we have another public debate in collaboration with the younger.